I know hardly anybody in the room. So it's going to be a very exciting workshop for me also, and a lot to learn from you. And I'm an urban planner by training, self-made transportation planner, I always like to say, and who then try to do some philosophy. And more or less successfully, that's up to you to decide. And, and I was kind of challenged by the title of the workshop, Mathematical Foundations for Equity. Wait, 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 wait. I think always philosophy comes first, and then we start thinking how we're going to do it, put it in equations for those who can do that. And am I visible like this for the camera? Where should I stand? It wasn't clear for me. Are you also there? Everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. excellent. Um, so I decided to flip it around, and it should really be philosophy before mathematics. Uh, right? Mathematics is a tool to do something, and I'm probably maybe insulting people saying, I don't think it asks fundamental questions, but maybe I might be wrong about that. Um, so anyway, I want to take you through partly my thought and, and trajectory over the past 20 years and uh, explain why I think it's important to start with philosophy and then move forward. And so the talk is uh, uh, organized in, in four, five parts. I first reflect a little bit on the literature that there is on transport and equity and uh, the distributive perspective that's dominant there. Uh, I will then share my small contribution, uh, my philosophy on transport justice, uh, show how I have applied it to US metropolitan areas, um, and um, then thinking about how to intervene, and I think that's where my project is an unfinished project. I know where to intervene, but I don't know how to find optimal solutions. So for me, it's one reason to come here is to learn about how do you find optimal solutions? What would be the best approach there? And then a brief conclusion. Um, so when I started working on equity, which is somewhere 20 years ago, and all the time for years, I kept saying, in 10 years, I hope I see the impact of my work. And the interesting thing is, it's happening. Uh, the Netherlands is now uh, uh, in its uh, first step towards the national transportation plan, has actually put equity uh, as one of the goals, which is uh, quite surprising. Uh, anyway, and I started reading about transport and equity, and, and when I started searching transport and justice, because I didn't know about the word equity so much, I just used justice, you didn't find much. When you used equity, you find much more. And I think it's because equity sounds much more Pleasant, less frightening, less challenging than justice. And so I think transport people, which tend to come from a more formal uh, mathematical uh, engineering background, are more comfortable with the term. And um, they tend implicitly to use what is called a distributive perspective to, to, uh, to justice, in a way. So justice is more than distribution. So typically, currently, we say it's about recognition, representation, and, and distributive justice, recognition being Acknowledging there's diversity, acknowledging people with their own traditions and values and cultures, representations about the democracy and how do you take democratic decisions. And distributive justice is about all these goods which are very important to people, which they really can't afford themselves, which we think the market should maybe not provide. And the question is, who should get what? And, and so this is the, the standard uh, definition of distributive justice. Distributive justice is the morally proper distribution of goods and bads among members of society. And there are basically three elements here, right? First of all, what are we distributing? The goods and the bads. The others are the members of society. Who are they? And the third and the most critical and most, most challenging part is morally proper. What is morally proper? And so if you look at the transport literature, you see that there's all kind of ways to interpret these three elements of this definition. And if you look at what, so what is being distributed, what are we analyzing that is being distributed, you see all kind of uh, tangible, intangible goods being analyzed and their patterns of distribution being discussed. So one is the money we put into transportation, who's paying them uh, and who's getting something back. The other is the services and, and infrastructures we provide to people uh, and also the time we give at, uh, at junctions and so forth. All this can be analyzed from a distributed perspective. Uh, do pedestrians get the same amount of time, time to cross as cars and so forth? Or should we do it by demand? And um, there's also uh, literature that looks more at the, so these are the, you could say the inputs. You've also researched that looks more on the outcomes of transportation systems. So the pollution they generate and how it's distributed over uh, different areas. Uh, the travel patterns that are the result of the transport system we designed. Do 
women travel more or less than men, longer or shorter trips, uh, the crashes and who's involved in crashes and who's less. Um, and more recently also, we're looking at satisfaction as a from a distributive perspective. So who's more and less satisfied with the transportation system, which is, goes a little bit towards welfare. And I won't take you too much into philosophy, but basically you see uh, the, the big uh, uh, different goods that are discussed in philosophical literature is like resources uh, versus uh, welfare outcomes uh, as the main uh, good to be distributed. Now, I was always very unhappy reading this literature. I always felt like, okay, it's nice technical work. We analyze something, but is this really what is so important? Is this really what counts? Is this really what is at stake? It seemed to me nice empirical studies that, you know, not necessarily give the right answer. So who's paying the taxes? Well, we wouldn't ask that question in education, right? I assume that the higher income groups are paying more for school. And nobody's raising that question in education. What we're studying, actually, is whether kids are getting education. And if we're succeeding to bring kids to their potential in school, because there's a very strong underlying assumption that education should be freely available to all, I think even in the US. Uh, I deliberately don't talk about healthcare, where the whole world has a different position from this country. Um, and so looking at health and education, where I think there's a very broad agreement in society what is fair and equitable, it seemed to be very weird that in transport we're looking at these little goods and we're worrying about them and we're not asking the fundamental question, what is transport actually supposed to give us? So education, we don't analyze who's getting the books and who's getting the teachers and how big are the classrooms uh, and if the courtyard is about the same size. We have some standards for that, but we don't really analyze it. It's really about our kids achieving their potential. And that's what we measure, because that's what education is about. And so my first uh, step in this field was basically thinking about a different perspective. And, and for this, I started reading philosophy, lots of philosophy, which tends to be very abstract, not talk about real goods, and, or at best about income and wealth, and, but not about education, health, and why are these uh, actually uh, uh, such strongly felt principles we have in those domains. And so going through the library and reading lots of books, I came across this book, which kind of, for me, like, created order. All of a sudden, I saw where I had to go in transport. Because uh, Michael Walzer basically says, social justice in society is not about some abstract structure of society, as John Rawls says, and, but it's really about really goods that are being distributed, which society cares about, and which society thinks they should not be distributed by the market. They should be actually distributed in a different way. They are so important to society that we should not allow the market to determine who gets them and who doesn't get them. And basically, he calls it, he used this key sentence in his book, goods with a social meaning deserve a separate sphere. So if a good is valued in a distinct way beyond its material or monetary value, then it also deserves a separate sphere with its own principle of justice. And he discusses, I think, about 14 different goods, hard work, uh, power, and education, health, and so forth. Not transport, though. And, but the beautiful thing is that his way of thinking basically opened for me the door to say, ah, we should think and look at transport and ask the question, what is the social meaning of transport? And um, the answer to that question uh, is twofold. First of all, Although there's lots of literature discussing the environmental externalities of transport, transport is not about the externalities. It's annoying, these externalities, and there are problems, and we should address them. But basically, they belong to a different sphere. I would say the sphere of a healthy environment. And lots of sectors in society actually create unhealthy societies. And the principle for healthy of society should then also decide what should happen in transport. But it's not what transport itself is about. We don't build transport systems to pollute more or less. Like we don't build transport systems, I think, to make sure we actively move to our destinations to have more active uh, movement, uh, which is the health argument today, which helps to move the needle in transport, but I don't think it's a proper argument. Transport is not about health. Transport is fundamentally about what enables people to do, to get to places. And it's about accessibility, and that's the fundamental good that is being dis distributed. And so that was my, my first paper, which took me endless to get published, by the way. Um, 
Because it was challenging, I think, uh, lots of perspectives, and it was also taking a perspective, a philosophical perspective, which is not common in our field. And so basically what I said there, accessibility, that's the social meaning. And I, I long grappled with the idea, is it not about mobility and the freedom of movement, which we very much cherish in Western society especially, right, it's linked to freedom, to adventure, and so forth, or whether it should be accessibility, which is a more boring concept, I would say, than freedom of movement. But in the end, if you would be somewhere in the desert and you have the freedom of movement, but you wouldn't get anywhere, transport wouldn't give you anything. So in the end, it's really about, can I get to places? Can I visit my grandmother? Can I go to my job? Can I find another job if I lose my job? Accessibility is not about just where you're going now, but it's about where you can go. And so that you're free to choose the way you want to live, the job you want to have, the sports you want to do, the friends you want to make and visit, the clothes you want to buy. And so essentially accessibility, which is measuring the range of activities you can reach given the transport system available and your personal means, is a very technical measure of freedom. I think that makes it very powerful. It defines the freedom for you to do what you want to do, can do. For basically, for you to flourish. And it's a very technical measure, which I mean is where, where we, we meet more mathematically oriented people and philosophy. It's a technical measure for something very, very fundamental. Uh, and we should develop it better and better because in the literature we're endlessly discussing what is the proper measure for accessibility. So that's one challenge we have. So this was the first step for me, uh, moving away from all these little goods, which I don't say we shouldn't study, you know, academic freedom exists and sometimes finding, analyzing little goods and seeing big disparities can really shake up things and open people's eyes. But if it would be for state DOT to direct their policy, then clearly we should think more fundamentally about accessibility. Second part of the definition of distributive justice is about who. So whom are we distributing the goods to? And there's basically two questions to be answered there. Sorry, sorry I have a quick yes. question. Just, um, this principle sounds like great, but what do, I mean, where are the limitations? Um, like. There are things that I have to do, like find a job, uh -huh. my family and so on. Yeah. Then there, there are things that I would like to do. Yeah. Uh, but we, as society, have to not encourage people to do whatever they like because then we produce so much greenhouse gas emissions and other things that it doesn't work. So where, there must be limitations built in as well. And your definition didn't have that in it at all. True. Good, good point. Um, so... Essentially, uh, if, uh, the question of justice arises because there is scarcity. If there wouldn't be scarcity, there wouldn't be a problem. So, a distributive perspective, kind of in a traditional way, I don't think it applies so much to accessibility, but it's like, there is a set of goods. This is what we have, and how do we distribute it? Now, the, the question you pose is, is the same, you could say, in, in healthcare. Healthcare is unlimited. I mean, there's so much more we can do to make people more healthy, to save people's lives to extend it another month, uh, and so forth. It's endless. And uh, still the principle is, is very general and very open-ended. And setting the boundaries is, you could say, political, pragmatic activity. So in healthcare, we have budgets, and we have information on uh, the impact of different treatments and the cost of different treatments. And we kind of, every year, I assume also in the US, well, it's, it's different. But in a country with a public health system in some kind of way, the government decides every year what is in the health package and what is not in the health package. And if it's outside, then bad luck. So the idea there is, given a fixed amount of resources, how do I best allocate them so that I maximize accessibility? Yeah, kind of. And I must honestly say, yeah, I never solved, you know, how, how do we decide how much to give to health care, how much to transport, which would be accessibility, how much to education? I must honestly say, I never thought about it. I thought about it, I didn't have an answer. <laughs> I'm a question. Sorry, my, my voice is very hoarse. Okay. By focusing only on accessibility, without taking into account the uh, externalities, mm -hmm. produces the problem that, that, that basically brought us at where we are today. That basically, for instance, minority communities experience highest level of externalities than the middle income people like us. Mm -hmm. And basically, I see the. Uh, I see what you're trying to do on defining 
what is the, the social meaning of transportation accessibility. But we cannot, we, I, I don't think we cannot disconnect okay. the, uh, the, the goods from the bad, in this case, the, uh, the externalities. And, and my question to you, there is a, a movement among in, environmental mm -hmm. activists about uh, environmental justice. Mm -hmm. That is basically trying yes. to compensate for the decades of transportation only considerations. How do you reconcile it? Two answers. One, one will come gradually through the presentation that actually, if you really care about accessibility and should be, you think it should be distributed fairly, you build an entirely different world than what we've done today, and it will be much more sustainable. So we'll explain that later on. And second is, as I tried to say in the beginning, so for me also, a healthy environment is a sphere of justice, which was also not discussed by uh, Michael Walzer, by the way, in his book. And also there we should have principles, and I think we actually have principles already, but they're mostly legal principles, but, in princi but implicitly there are actually social justice arguments. So the air is not supposed to be more polluted than X with this, and more than Y with that and that with that, and in principle we say if you don't go beyond that level, the situation is fair. And yes, there are disparities, it will create disparities, but they remain within the boundaries of reason. That's what we implicitly say. We, we never thought about it too deeply, because the consequence of that is, of course, that if you have lower income, you will have more pollution, in most cases, right? Because if you have money, you will choose the cleaner places, if possible. But you will also balance out accessibility versus pollution, so you might actually choose more pollution and more accessibility. And, and so, if you, know, if you would ask me personally, I'd say there are strict boundaries for me around the transport system. It's come from the, from the, the health environment sphere, which say, you know, we should also decrease probably CO2 emissions, and we shouldn't have more than this local pollution, and this has implications for transport. And within these boundaries, we have to optimize accessibility within the boundaries. So for me, that is a strict limitation. Um, I, I do not emphasize it so much because I think that the field of transport for 70 years has been completely confused. First, it has been confused thinking that it's about providing a system that gives everyone free-flowing traffic. And that was the major goal, and all our tools are geared to that. And then when we started criticizing them, we started talking about the environmental argument and sustainability. And actually we say, no, we're, not. we're generating terrible pollution. And so we have to make sure that travel behavior is less polluting. And in order to do this, we have to offer attractive alternatives to those who drive a car. So at the first 50, 60 years, we built a system that was basically geared towards higher income groups that could afford a car, and gradually it became lower and lower income. Then the sustainability approach strengthens only that. It says, oh, these guys create more pollution, so we give them attractive alternatives, so they will not pollute so much. And again, we ignore people who have not been served very well. So that's also why I think the sustainability argument actually took us away from thinking about fairness, although it's supposed to be part of the sustainability definition. Anyway, I'll continue uh, um, here. So the, the, so the what question is all these goods? I, I think we should focus on accessibility, and it's not the only thing, of course, we should take into account. Um, we should also think about traffic crashes and so forth. Um, so who? So who are we distributing the good to? So there's two questions. So who belongs to the community? Who should we take into account? Is it only citizens? Is it residents? Is it legal residents? or anybody living in an area. Um, and the second question, if we know who is our community we're concerned about, how we actually d distinguish them in different groups so that we can understand whether everybody gets his fair share. What are the things we should take into account when analyzing who gets what? And that the focus in the literature has been on the second part, or, or very pragmatically, people have analyzed the distribution of different goods over different kind of um, groups of people. And these are some of the things you see a lot in the literature. Income, gender, race and ethnicity, age, abilities, retirement status, a kind of a mixture of all kind of indicators leading to EJ commit committees, environmental justice committees, <coughs> disadvantaged groups. 
Sometimes the analysis focuses on people who own a home versus who rent a home, uh, car ownership, or if you ask tra uh, travel satisfaction, you analyze that. Uh, people who use different modes are uh, compared. So there's a, a wide variety of groups are being analyzed and compared. Who gets more, who gets less, who's better off, who's worse off. And again, it made me feel nervous. Not because these groups are not important, not because there are no disparities between these groups, but because not all of them are so closely linked to transport, or they, although there is a correlation, the correlation goes through another, um, another um, characteristic. And so retirement status has some impact, but it's not a crucial shaping factor of somebody's mobility. What is more important is some, whether somebody can keep driving, whether somebody can, uh, is healthy to walk, and whether he has enough income after retirement to actually uh, afford himself travel. And so I think we should be much more mm, focused in analyzing the groups. Like we should be much more focused in the good, and we should actually ask the question, what are the key factors shaping a person's accessibility? And these are, in my perspective, three key things, and there are other factors that add a layer to it. Um, but the three things are basically where you live, or where you, can, where you can live, whether you can afford a vehicle, a motorized vehicle, where you can own it, and maybe also where you can drive it. And the, the second question is layered to income. So you can own a vehicle, but you cannot necessarily operate it when you want. So lots of low-income people do have a car. In many cases, it's just for two months parked, in front of the house because it's broken and they can't afford to fix it. Or the trips they want to make are considered too expensive and they wouldn't use it and would rather spend more time using public transport or walking somewhere. So income is an additional variable to ownership of a vehicle. Now obviously, whether you have impairments adds a layer to this. If you're old or a woman, adds a layer to this because of social safety concerns with which others might not experience so strongly. But if you yeah, make it very, uh, if you start unraveling it so much, you lose the focus on the big disparities that exist in the system, and I want to show that later on. Yeah. I, I thought it's interesting that it's, these are like the three fundamental factors shaping accessibility, and one of them is can you own a car? Yes. I think it's just kind of, it's just not what I expected, where it's like that's wow. kind of like the base thing of like, well, if, you, if you're like a car driver and owner, then that kind of like, is like the jumping off point to other forms of transit. It's like, if you can't, okay, now we start jumping into like other forms of transit. It's like, it just seems like not something that's fundamental, but like maybe it is in some way or? Well, if you build on for 70 years a system that's completely based around the car, and that's even true in Europe, uh, to my regret, it became, fun we made it fundamental. Because now it almost seems like people like, oh, well, maybe cars now aren't like the panacea that they were painted to be. But I guess it is kind of like a jumping off point in a sense because of like what you said. It's like that was the push for so long to switch every, at least in America, to switch to like a, the interstate system, the car-based infrastructure. It's just interesting. So maybe to put it in perspective, in Europe, in the countries I know, and including Israel, which is not kind of Europe, and some disagreement about it. Um, there was in the 60s always a uh, politician, typically from the Labour Party, the Social Democrats, whose vision for transport for the future was a car for every household. So it's not such a, not only a US thing, okay? We adopted that approach and it became as if, it's seen as a fundamental a tool for freedom of movement, for emancipation, and for independence, and and so in today's society, it's crucial. And I would say even in a country, uh, a city-state like Singapore, having a car still gives you huge benefits, although it has a superb public transport system. And so you, you, maybe you should define it in a more general way. The mobility tools you have available. And that's better. That's better. So if it's only walking you can do, you don't bike, then it's more limited. But then it gets, you, you start splitting in more groups. And again, there's the risk you lose for the detail the bigger picture. Yes. I was wondering if you're thinking of accessibility with respect to particular destinations or if it's kind yeah. of agnostic to that. Like, you know, if I'm someone who needs to go to the hospital frequently, that's maybe very different than someone mm -hmm. who's 
very healthy or if I mm -hmm. work remotely at home versus mm -hmm. like have a long commute. It's the endless discussion in accessibility literature. So, so that I, the fact that I identified accessibility as the key good in transport, in a way, was nothing new. I mean, since the late 80s, there's a lot of accessibility literature, uh, which also claim we should move away from mobility, which focus on whether we can actually move towards whether we get, can get to places, uh, very much driven by, by urban planners, I would say, against transportation experts. Um, and, <clears throat> and since that moment, I mean, the notion of accessibility is, was coined more in the, in the late 50s. Um, there's been endless discussion about how we should measure accessibility. Accessibility to what? Um, where the cost should be included, or only time, or maybe also other things, like if you analyze public transport accessibility, should it include transfers? How many transfers are reasonable? How much waiting time is, is reasonable? What is the reasonable walking distance to a bus stop? There's no end to these technical questions, and there is no answer to them, I would say. There is no... Um, there's no fundamental answer. There's something to say for this, something to say for that. There's the impedance function, meaning a job far away is worth less than a job close by, but how much less is the job worth? And also, if you're healthy, access to a hospital is very important, because tomorrow you might be in hospital, right? So accessibility is really about this opportunity, and that's why I like to, to talk about it in general terms, and I also think you should analyze it in a very simplistic way again, because you will never solve the tiny we need details and agree on them. And again, it hides the real problem because the gaps are so huge that no matter how you would measure it, you always find the same groups being very poorly served. Um, so it's like accessibility people are actually doing themselves a disfavor by continuously disagreeing with them. So we are academics and we always like to be outsmart the other. Uh, and, and, and the result is that the world out there keeps using mobility-based standards so congestion, uh, travel uh, time losses as the ma main criteria to assess transport systems, which basically doesn't tell us if you have good accessibility. I would say the accessibility in LA is, might not be that great, uh, even though people drive a lot. Yeah. And then, I mean, maybe traffic is not moving either, either by the way. Uh, so it's not scoring good on any way. Uh, yeah, so maybe so mobility portfolio is what I typically use as a more general term, is better, is better. Yes, thanks. Um, Third question, the most complex one, a philosophical question in a way, or not in a way, it's a fundamentally philosophical question, is what principle, what is, how do you morally, properly distribute the good you selected? Whether you selected the taxes or the traffic light time, and so forth. I think, in my perspective, it all goes back to accessibility. So, if you want to decide about your traffic light assignment, you should look at accessibility and then go back to your traffic time. You, can, you cannot decide it on the junction level because it's part of a system that is supposed to deliver accessibility. So it's not about how many people come and everybody's fair share or the same amount of minutes for each type of mode. It is really about who has poor accessibility and who doesn't, I think. Anyway, in the literature, when you look at the principle, you could say there's two types of framing. There's this agnostic literature, which basically uses the term of disparities. It's kind of with these differences. And they just analyze, they take two groups, they take a good, and they say, ah, there's, there's a disparity. Mm -hmm. Implicitly, of course, between the lines, and sometimes explicitly, they feel there's something wrong, right? And, but they never really explicitly say that this is wrong. They just say, you know, the poor people have less, the black people have less. Oh, sorry, what did I do? And, oh, it's more easy than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's where it ends, the story. So they are really agnostic in a way and try to avoid normative statements, which is very much, you know, a result of the positivistic framing of what a science is all about, what proper research is. You're supposed to be positivist, neutral, objective, and you just describe what you find and there's no values involved. And then there's a second type which uses the term equity, which I already said, equity is less frightening than justice, so justice you will ra rarely find. Sometimes you find fairness, but also that is considered, I think, too much scary. And so they use the term equity, and, and then they define it in many, many ways. Uh, and they, they do often explicitly or exp implicitly formulate a principle. And so these are some of the principles you can find in the literature. Equality, it's often used as an implicit standard. So we see differences, and it's, it's not equal, so it's a problem, and we don't really 
We use more normative language in the disparity literature, but we don't really explicitly say equality is what is desirable. But often it's also used explicitly, and then we use a measure like the Gini coefficient that can show whether a good is distributed equally over different population groups. There is the terrible confusion in the literature between horizontal and vertical equity, which continuously, if I'm reviewing, tell the author, these are the same things, you are confusing what you're talking about. And the horizontal equity basically says you should treat the same people, people with the same characteristics in the same way, and vertical equity says you should people with different characteristics in a different way. That is saying the same thing, uh, right? If you treat the same people with the same characteristics in the same way, you mean also you treat people with different characteristics in a different way. So they are one of the same thing and they're, they're, they're not helpful. And more suitable principles, proportionality, you see a lot in the EJ literature on environmental uh, pollution, where the argument is goods should be distributed roughly proportional to the share in the population. So if Hispanics are 12% of the population, it's fine if they get 15 or 9% of the, po uh, the pollution, that is roughly proportional. Um, but if it would be 20 or 25, that would be disproportional and it's a problem. So realizing that equality you cannot achieve because of geography, and geography makes it very difficult to, it's not like you know, school books you can give to everyone, makes it very difficult to achieve equality, so we use proportionality. Pareto, more looking at investments and seeing whether if you make an investment or a change, whether somebody is negatively affected, and if nobody is negatively affected, it's supposed to be fair, and because only someone benefits. Sufficiency, uh, I will come back to that in a minute. Uh, some people just take the principle of John Rawls, which he wrote an entire book to defend, uh, but it wasn't about transport at all, and certainly about traffic lights, or about roads, or about road space. It was about income and wealth. And his argument is that Maximin applies to income and wealth. It does not apply to other goods unless you can prove it applies to those goods. So simply taking a principle from some philosopher who is very much esteemed, and applying it to whatever good you're analyzing is doing very bad work, in my perspective. Maxi Max is what I proposed in this first paper I showed you, and I've evolved away from that. Um, although I still consider it an, an, an uh, unfinished project. Uh, so what is missing in this literature, which I understand, and which why it took me five years to get my paper published, is they don't justify the principle. They just throw the principle, maybe there's two sentences giving some kind of intuitive explanation why this would be a proper principle, but they don't systematically justify why this would be the proper principle of justice to apply to that particular good. And basically that's what is social justice is all about. It's not about thinking of a principle, it's about defending the principle as systematically as possible. And that's also why we consider social justice not a matter of values only, but a matter of science or systematic thinking, and it's one of the oldest. Um, science is not a good word, but in Dutch we have more. Science is related to the exact sciences here. Yeah, you would, yeah science sounds good here also, because we use a, a word that's more neutral towards what kind of science, social science, humanities, is all the same. Right, it's one of the oldest ones, very respected, and the old guys are still being cited, uh, for good and for bad. And so that has been lacking. So, you can already understand what I did for years, was think about that. And uh, think about it very quietly, systematically, reading lots of books. And, and then in the end, writing my book uh, about transport justice. And, and which my major challenge was, it was an open-ended search for the proper principle to distribute accessibility. So I already figured out in that paper that accessibility is the right good to be distributed. Now, according to which principle? I, I suggested some principles in my uh, paper, but I wasn't convinced myself. It wasn't very systematic and very powerful. And so the challenge in the book was to, um, to actually um, come up with the answer. And I started with that open-ended. And I've been also, when I came to the answer, I've been walking around and around and around and thinking about it for months, because I wasn't happy with the answer. But it was the best one I could defend, so that's still where the book ends. And I'm going to share you where I am at the moment. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's a very powerful principle. So basically, I, I, I base myself on, on Ronald Warkin's work, um, who bases himself on, on John Rawls, and I applied his way of thinking about 
distribution of, of scare goods, and I used thought experiments, which philosophers like to do. You create abstract situations and then try to think, like, how would you act in such abstract situations? What would be the proper way to act? What would be the logical way to act? So John Rawls uh, invented a device called the Veil of Ignorance. And um, I don't know to what extent people know what the, device, what the Veil of Ignorance is. No? OK, so let me quietly tell us, because he's somebody enthusiastically nodding. And, uh, uh, the Veil of Ignorance, basically, the idea is that in thinking about justice, it is crucial to be neutral. And since we are, none of us is neutral, we are all born somewhere and come from a certain culture and a certain perspective, we will always be biased in our thinking. So in order to be neutral, we should be put behind a veil of ignorance where we don't know what we will be in society, but we do know how society works. So we know that there's something like an economy. We know that you have to work to have a, make a living. You know, you can be old and young and you can fall ill and all these things you know. You know, there's space in society and there's geography and there's distance. And, but you don't know what you will be in society. And not knowing what you'll be in that society, you have to think about what is fair. And in Rawls' book, it's about deciding about a, a fair distribution of income and wealth, uh, and basic liberties. And I thought, we can also use this device if we also add Dworkin's perspective, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, to transport. We put people behind the veil of ignorance, and they have to th design a transport system not knowing who they will be. Whether they will be a man or a woman, rich or poor, young or old, or frail uh, or very uh, healthy, or whatever. Give it another name. And you don't know who you will be, and you have to design a transport <coughs> system. And Dworkin adds to this a, a very crucial um, perspective is that and you should realize that the transport system you agree on behind the veil of ignorance you have to finance you as society have to finance it so it will cost you money to deliver that system because the transport system costs money it doesn't come for free and if you spend more on that system you can spend it on your own stuff because we as society have to bring up the money to have a transport system it doesn't come for free. Now, behind the veil of ignorance, there's another rule. The moment you agree on the principle, you cannot change it anymore. You will have to live with it your entire life. It's not like, you know, we agreed on the principle, let me go to vote, you elect somebody else, and you will change the principle, which I like. No, 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 no. Behind the veil of ignorance, you sign on it for the rest of your life, you have to live with it, no matter who you will be when the veil of ignorance is lifted. And so in my thought exercise, there's a metropolitan area where we, the people behind the Veil of Rickmans know that there are jobs in certain places and there's housing. And that we have to connect all these places and hospitals and other places and we have to connect them in order to get there and to actually have to have a fulfilling life. But we don't know whether we will be rich or poor and so whether we can afford ourselves a car with a driver or buy ourselves a jet or build ourselves a... Uh, Hyperloop, we don't know. We don't know where we can use those systems if society decides to build them but they're not accessible to wheelchair users. We don't know whether we can afford them. So we start thinking very critical. Oh, if we build a system, it should be usable also for people with disabilities. If we build a system also with a low income, I should be able to use it. But you're not so generous that you want to give up all your means and and make sure that no matter who you are and how bad luck, how much bad luck you have in society, you will get the same as when you are lucky. Because that will be very expensive. You realize that if everybody gets the same, we have to compensate people who have less. So I have to take some of my money, I'm lucky. And the poor guy has to have the same level of accessibility, so I have to subsidize his rides on the high-speed rail and his parking place and his private car maybe, and I don't know what. It will be very expensive for me. So I, I'm not willing to do this, because the chance that I have good luck exists, and then I have to pay lots of taxes. That's unpleasant. So I kind of find a balance between what is hopefully will happen, or what might happen. But what might happen has to be bearable. And bearable means, basically, that I can always get to places. Because if I wouldn't be able to get to places, life would be unbearable. If I can't get a job because there's no transport system that can take me there, I couldn't earn a living. I would be terribly poor. If I couldn't get to the hospital, 
I couldn't get treatment. If I couldn't get to my family and friends, I would be socially isolated. So you want to make sure you have some level of accessibility. So that when the veil of ignorance is lifted, and you happen to be poor, also then you're served by the transport system. Or when the veil is lifted and it proves that you have impairments, also then you are served. But you're not served the same extent as those who are lucky, because that would be too much taxpayer money. And so the principle I came up with, and while talking I feel why I feel it's wrong, and I'm not 100% convinced, but it's the power, most powerful thing I came up with, is that a fair transport system is a transport system that provides everybody with sufficient accessibility. Is it? Excuse me? What does that mean exactly? Exactly. It's beautiful. You come up with something and but it has, I don't have the wonderful slides that show how powerful, how powerful it is. I'll tell you in a minute. This is an engineering definition, first of all, which I think is the wrong way to treat a, so, a good of a social meaning. It shouldn't have an engineering definition, so I flip it around and I say, every person is entitled to sufficient accessibility. It's a basic right, like everybody's entitled to basic education. Now, what does it mean? So first of all, we're back to the question, how do you measure accessibility? And we don't really have a good answer to that, except my proposition, keep it simple. I'll talk about it in a minute. I don't know where I'm with time. I hope you're fine, because I still have a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> we have 15 minutes. You've had some questions. Usually, we would keep 10 minutes for Q&A, but maybe you can take another time. <laughs> okay, time. okay. Now, the interesting thing is, so what I learned also, I'm not a philosopher, okay? Uh, I read philosophy, but what I learned from philosophy is, is you can come up with a principle, but you cannot come up with a proper level. So Rawls didn't say, you know, this is the difference between the lowest and the highest income. He said there's a maximum principle. You should, you, you can allow differences in income and wealth as long as those differences generate more economic overall income that then lifts the lowest level higher up. When you make the gap different, uh, even larger, and it doesn't benefit the lowest income anymore, that's where you should stop. But where that point is, it's an empirical question. Rawls wouldn't be able to give the answer. And so it's here. So I wouldn't know what a sufficient level is. I can tell you lots about the literature which shows that if you have low accessibility, indeed you don't have a job, indeed you don't go to the doctor, indeed you are socially isolated. And this sounds like, to me, like too little. But obviously there's a huge, and there's lots of people have plenty, probably everybody in the room has plenty of accessibility, right? We are on the right side of society. And so I don't think we have anything to complain, even if we're in traffic jams. And then there's a, a gray area in the middle. We say, well, it might not be enough. That sounds not very pleasant. People are forgoing trips. People are not seeing their family a lot because it takes too much time to get to there. They skip going to the doctor because the fresh hour is terrible. Somewhere there is a level. What it is, I don't know. But if you ac accept a principle, it doesn't really matter. The moment you accept a principle, you have to analyze who has enough and who doesn't have enough. And you have to deliver on that principle you agreed upon. So I will show you in a minute that no matter how ridiculously low you put the standard in the US, and I think in most countries, there are always people below that standard. And you're Duty then, according to, if you accept this basic principle, is to improve their situation. This is your primary duty. This is what transport is all about. So, a clarification question, because yes. of terminology. Do you call this still a version of equity, or would you say that it's not equity, but that's what we should do instead? Equity is a, is a, is a, is a, is a catch-all term. Yeah. Like, like fairness, justice, equity. In, in my perspective, these three terms mean the same thing. They ask what is just, but they don't define what is just. Okay, so you would still classify this as some version of equity? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you. I just don't like the word equity, but that's, right. that's okay. a personal taste right. issue. Right. Yeah. 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 You're cautious about the circumstances. If you're yes. about the person, you say every. Yes. Every is very, very strong. Yes. And it has to do also with mm -hmm. individual behavior. Yes. If I choose to stay mm -hmm. uh, ah. in the middle of yes. the desert, yes. The usual argument I get. Sorry. The usual argument. <laughs> no, no, I mean, That's okay. It's, it's a legitimate argument. Um, so my, argu my, my counter argument is, is pragmatic there. And so it is, if, if you have ever employed someone, 
and you are not satisfied with him and you have to fire it, it's extremely difficult to say, is it really insufficient? Should I fire that person? Can it go on? Another two months? Let's see. It is very difficult, even if you're close to somebody, to actually decide whether the person deserves someone. Now we're sitting up somewhere in a state government or we're sitting somewhere up at the federal level even and we have to decide, you made the decision yourself. It was your choice. Can you really confidently say that somebody made a choice? or that somebody ended up there because of the circumstances. I think that's very difficult to decide, and I would then give the person the benefit of the doubt. Now, this principle also, yeah, in, as you know, this is the ideal. Uh, like the ideal is that I think, I assume the US, US also has in its constitution that the right to housing, I'm not sure. More than 100 countries have it in their constitution, the right to housing. But not, no, no country delivers on this fully, right? The idea is that you build up a system to try to deliver, and yes, the case you described remotely, yes, you can't deliver. You can't deliver. So we can, we can give something, but not, not justice. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. You have focus on basically ensuring that all individuals mm -hmm. receive in a certain, in, in a sense, to spread out accessibility in a way. Mm -hmm. Accessibility is, mm -hmm. in economic terms, like the, uh, like the you know, benefit. Increase economic welfare. Yes. We will have externalities mm -hmm. that diminish that. Yeah. Did you consider basically uh, a metric that takes into account the benefits of transportation systems minus the, uh, the externalities that transportation produces? Um, like a net benefit. Talking about net benefits and Typically, in a traditional perspective at least, I don't know how you want to develop it, but typically then ignores how it's distributed over groups. Well, you could also do it by, asking. yes, you could do it by groups, but I think then it's, it's still two different things. So translating both negative impacts of pollution and benefits of accessibility into monetary terms and then making it a net benefit, kind of... But in answer, my rule is... Yeah. It's better to be 20% correct than not accounting for an effect. But it's not that you not account. I am in the sphere of transport, and in the sphere of transport, we have the duty to deliver sufficient accessibility to all. And some other guys somewhere else, I hope on the planet, who's in the healthy environment sphere and says, we have to deliver healthy environments for everyone. Then in practice, these two guy, guys meet, and they have to find a compromise somewhere. You at the beginning, you're criticizing the the planets, genetic systems, that only consider roads. Mm -hmm. And now we have only consider accessibility. But I consider, but I consider all people. Ah, but again, but the No, but the people are crucial. In transport, it is about accessibility. And we should deliver it within environmental, very strict, I would be very strict, very strict environmental standards, in my perspective. But that's not, that is not an argument in transport. That's an argument that comes from somewhere else. And the argument in argumentation in transport is completely confused. We all the time get this, because transport has so much external impacts, we get confused about what transport is about. So now we have the health and transport literature, which is very powerful and it's, it's okay, I have no problems with it. It, shape, it reshapes thinking about transport. But the transport system is not about making me healthy. It's great that if I use the bus, I walk a bit more and I will be more healthy. But that's not a reason to design the system that, that makes me to walk. It would be crazy. The duty of transport planners is to make sure I can get to places. And if then in that effort I also walk, great, side benefit. I wouldn't design a school so that kids walk as much as possible from one class to the other so they will be more healthy. No, you design a school so the kids can learn well. That is the first criterion. And then if and this, there are some side benefits, great. But it's side benefits. But, but the environmental argument is more powerful. It's, a, it's a, for me, a, a, a very strict framework within which you should deliver. Is it possible that you can raise the sufficiency level yeah. so high that it actually becomes counterproductive, even in physical, right? So let's say we raise the minimum wage to $30, uh -huh. $50. Yeah. Could it become actually counterproductive that even the most disadvantaged member of society will actually get hurt? Would that be justice? I, I, I don't see the same dynamic happening with accessibility. Like that you have so much accessibility that you don't have to work anymore, you don't have to move from the house, no. 
Like it's not the same dynamic, right? And, In order to yeah. raise the access to level to such a high level, I mean, let's say no. society somehow foolishly determined we have to raise the, everybody's uh, accessibility level to a very, very high level. Uh -huh. What if that become counterproductive? It seems the principle itself is not uh, self, uh, self, self. I feel like you kind of covered that in the in the veil thing, right? It's like if you invest so much that now it like yeah. starts harming people, then that's kind of like. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> yeah. True, true, exactly. So it would, it would be counterproductive. But, but accessibility is, is very, it's always uh, something you, we, we, we actually produce together, right? It's because that somebody opens a shop that I have accessibility to that, job, that shop. Uh, because somebody creates a company and there's jobs, I have access to those jobs. So it's, it's something we, we create together and it's not something we can just go up and up and up. It's like there is a certain level and depending on where you live, it might be higher or lower. And depending on the modes of transport, the mobility portfolio you have available, it might be higher or lower. But it's not that we yeah, I guess we can endlessly push it. My argument is with, maybe we need another sort of um, clause in your principle that says we should not. There may be a, there may be a level that we cannot go beyond because that will become counterproductive. Would that be sort of? So, so, Okay, so I'll show what, what I've done, uh, what I've applied, so how I define the sufficiency level, because I define it as a, a percentage of the average. And um, so, which you would always set below the average, right? You can never be all below, above the average. And um, so, so, so maybe more fundamentally, I think society cannot function if the accessibility is low. So, you know, economic productivity will go down and so forth. So there's always a certain level of accessibility to function. And you don't have to push it very high to already have benefits from, uh, from that. So I have to think about it if you need a, uh, yeah. Super, super quick question. Yeah. What do you exactly mean by accessibility in the following circumstance? Let's say I am sick. Mm -hmm. I, I am on, on ID or some uh, ID infusion or something like this, and I need to be flown somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's obviously a big operation, takes a certain amount mm -hmm. of time. There's a certain minimal physical time required. Yeah. Is there a possibility that I'm perfectly healthy and I want to fly somewhere? Yeah. There's obviously less amount of time that's required for it. How do you compare the two? So, so would you say there are different times for that kind of thing? or? Yeah, to some extent, because my approach is focused on the everyday things of life. So if you want to travel far away for your holiday, that's really up to you. So it's, it's linked to what we, what we think is a normal, reasonable quality of life. It's still, the accessibility should allow you that. So, so you're talking about time or you're talking about something more complicated than that? Because it can be time, it can be cost, it can be effort, it can combine all those three. And it's like the imagine I, circumstances where the effort required to move a person is much higher for yeah. various circumstances, and true, you have to account for that somehow. Too. But so, but you, you, so although the distributive framing seems to focus on the person, it's really about developing a system, a transport system. Yeah, a system. For, for example, if you if you try to set, set a certain amount of effort for me to go from here mm -hmm. to the other end of campus. Mm -hmm. Um, the amount of effort required for a person who's in a wheelchair is going to be very high, mm -hmm. right? And so if you then say that everybody's entitled to that amount of effort, you will undercut a lot of the, uh, I mean, the, that le level of effort is inappropriate, maybe, for a typical person. So that would be setting the... This problem. example would suggest that you have to have a campus service so that this person can more easily move around campus in some way. That would is how I would if you think that the effort is too high, if it's below the sufficiency level, if it takes too much effort, then we take. This is the average effort. Now you may take some more effort, but you know this seems to be unreasonable. This would be then how I would do, and then we have to try to find a solution for it. I think. I move on. Um, so I applied it. Uh, ah, another question? Sorry. You will leave it? Yeah? Ah, he's getting nervous. <laughs> so we, we have about, I think, three minutes. I don't know three how, minutes? How, how, how three how minutes? Three minutes? Yeah. So uh, it's not his fault. <laughs> definitely not. I, uh, my answer 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 yeah. Okay. So this is the principle, right? And, and so now I'm applying it. So first of all, in my perspective, we should apply it at a metropolitan level. What we call in geography the daily urban system, so where people organize their lives. 
It's not something you should apply at, at a national level because every region is different. And, and I generate, and so we have some mathematics finally, uh, an index of transport justice, which I have given different names over the time, and pick your choice. And, and it basically takes two things into account. So we identify population groups, so basically neighborhoods, right, because residential location is important, or a block. And, and in the old block, there are different people based on income and, and car ownership. And each block delivers a certain level of accessibility depending on which transport modes you can use and where the block is in the transport system, right? And if you're below the sufficiency level, that's what I call the depth of accessibility insufficiency. So the deeper you are, the lower your accessibility, the more you should be accounted for and the more you have a claim to improvement because you're being maltreated. So how far is a population group below? sufficient threshold. And the second is how many people are affected. So if there's only two people living in that block that happen to be without a car and are not served well, who cares? If there are thousands, we're getting more. No, we still care, but clearly the urgency is less. And so I took a measure from uh, poverty measurement, uh, which basically takes these two things into account, which you can do the same with, uh, with a in basic income level, right? If you're below the income or minimum income level, below the income level, how many people are below that level? And so the equation looks like this, which for you is easy to read, but for me not. So this is the total population in a region. Uh, this is the size of a group in a certain neighborhood or a block. Uh, this is the accessibility level enjoyed by that group. So depending on the modes they have uh, available, they have a certain access to opportunities, uh, abstractly defined. And uh, Z is the accessibility sufficiency threshold, and we apply it. And in that uh, approach in income, they uh, put it to the square, square, to the square root. And which means that basically the number of people is, is accounted for less than the, actually the, how far you are below the sufficiency level. And we do it, of course, only for groups that are below the sufficient level. All the others are fine. They don't need, deserve improvement. Uh, and basically, the, you can have either a zero score, then you're above the sufficiency threshold, so the lower score is better, and if you're high, then the entire population is below the sufficiency level, and you're very poor off. Um, and we did it in 49 US metropolitan areas. Uh, we only looked at public transport accessibility, but used car-based accessibility as the standard, assuming that with a car, you're relatively well off in the US, but it misses people that have a car but have very low accessibility, so more on the fringes of a metropolitan area that might occur. And we analyze the block group level and at grid level, and we compare regions and uh, we analyze the pattern in the uh, 49 regions. And so here I'm going to show you the results we have uh, here on the x axis, the, uh, the accessibility fairness index, so between 0 and 1. Here are all 49 cities or regions. And we used uh, about 11 different sufficiency thresholds for lack of a policymaker that told us this is the proper level. So we just thought we'd play around with those levels. And, and this is the result you see uh, with every uh, square cubicle representing one uh, sufficiency level. So on the, this side is if you say 1% of the accessibility enjoyed by an average car owner, so if an average person with access to a car and sufficient income can reach a million jobs. If you can reach 10,000, you're fine, or more, right? And so New York is actually doing, if you take a very low standard relatively well, and surprisingly, LA is also doing surprisingly well, number three in the list of 49 uh, metros. And, but if you move to 50% threshold, a much higher threshold, and then obviously the uh, situation changes and uh, LA is no longer performing very well. So, and no region is performing well. They're pretty close to one, which you would expect in the US. Um, and uh, if you analyze, if you use a 50% threshold to analyze how many people are affected, then 99% of all low income people, which we assume that a car is expensive for them to afford, even if they have one, maybe they don't use it all the time, 99% of them don't have enough accessibility in the metropolitan areas. Uh, so that's the situation in the US. Uh, in Amsterdam it's better, but it's also uh, not perfect, definitely not, where we also need to work. One minute, it's impossible, two hours interventions. Oh, uh, <laughs> give me five. <laughs> um, okay, let me skip this. Um, so 
intervention means, okay, we figure out who has in insufficient accessibility. We, we know it's substantial, even if we take a 10% uh, standard, which I did later on. Now, who should we serve first? Where should we intervene? And for this, we use the same equation, but slightly differently, uh, where basically it's an equation that tells me how much each group, each block, contributes to overall uh, in in injustice in, in the region. And so basically, you get a percentage for each grid cell or each block or each block group. And together, all these percentages add up to the entire uh, lack of accessibility in the region. And if you do this, so we did it for uh, a few cities. And this, this example is Atlanta. So we use a 10% threshold. And on the x axis, we, we, we organize all these uh, grid cells uh, by the population size. And on the y axis is their contribution to the overall problem. So totally, all the grid cells that are below the sufficient level add up to 100% of the problem. And because there are thousands of grid cells one kilometer by one kilometer in Atlanta, they, their contribution is like, this is 0.05%. Okay, it's not 5%, it's 0.05%. And you get this image. So each dot is a grid cell. And you see there's lots of grid cells with very few people in them, actually on low income without a car. And most of them have zero accessibility, so they're here. Because the larger your population, the more you can contribute, because it's a, it's a game between the size of the population and the contribution. So if you see this, you would say, ah, these are the main contributors. Let's focus on those, and let's make their situation better. That would be a smart transport investment, because then I'm reducing some of the overall problem, right, substantially. It's still not even a pro percentage, but together they are more than 1% already. So if we do every year 1% in 100 years, we are fine. Doesn't sound too good. <laughs> uh, but this will be a mistake. Um, and I'm greatly getting to what I want to learn here. This will be a mistake because if you analyze where these areas are, well, they tend to be distributed over the region, some of them. And transport is essentially a, a network, a system. So you should think from the system you already have and how can you efficiently bring people above this efficiency line? And not just look at where is the problem most severe, but where actually can effectively, efficiently improve the situation. And so for this, to understand this, we analyze the spatial pattern of, uh, of insufficient accessibility. And we put on the x-axis, so again, all 49 regions. And on the x-axis, we, we took, in each region, we did, Arrange them by uh, concentric rings of two kilometers. So we start in the CBD of the uh, <clears throat> most the city that gave its name to the region, and then we go out with two uh, kilometer rings, and we, we calculate how much in each ring uh, each ring contributes to overall of the problem of lack of accessibility. And then you get this pattern, uh, and we did it for the ten uh, percent sufficient threshold. And you get this pattern where you see that. 50% <clears throat> of the problem is actually located very close to the city center. It's not spread all, it's spread all over, right? This is 50%, so up to here, is actually close to the city center from 8 kilometers to about 32 kilometers. So actually in an area which you can reasonably serve with an improved transport system. And so if you take a, a perspective at the map of Atlanta, you see how much hotspots there are where Atlanta here, this is tiny areas above the sufficiency level in the center, and around it there are huge areas with low-income population and very few accessibility. And you start seeing that you should build a transport system gradually outward. And so the mathematical challenge, which I didn't solve yet, uh, is to develop analytical approaches. So you have the problem identified, you have a transport system, now you think which links I can improve that would bring as many people as possible above the sufficiency line. I think that's a major mathematical challenge, uh, far beyond my abilities. So I'm very happy to cooperate with somebody on that. So I come to a conclusion uh, because I, before I get thrown out. So equity analysis, so I use the word equity to make people not too nervous, should account for, in my perspective, and I hear the critique, but I'm unrelentless. It should focus on what transport is all about, it's getting people to places. And that's the essential thing. We should distinguish between well-served people and poorly served people and not get confused about race and gender. They are correlated to poorly served uh, and, 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 and less well served, but they are not the cause of it. The co underlying cause is where people live, what kind of income they have, uh, and that shapes then also their mobility portfolio. 
we have to move away from what we do in the US, where there's lots of equity analysis happening, but they're, not, they're just completely random as part of decision-making processes. US does it. And we should use, really, like we have in education, a proper principle of justice. And then we should use that principle to identify um, transport investment that actually promote justice. And we should actually move all our money, which now goes to road widenings and interchanges to enhance justice. And I'm here for this, because I think it requires entirely new mathematical and analytical tools. So thanks for your attention and for your questions. And uh, if there's any time. <laughs>